Welcome to the second course in CloudAcademy.com's video series on preparing to take and pass the AWS Solutions Architect Associate Level Certification Exam. By joining us for these courses, you'll be introduced to all the basic skills you'll need to master AWS administration. This course will focus on AWS networking, and this video specifically on EC2 networking. EC2, of course, is AWS's toolbox for configuring, provisioning, securing, and managing the virtual computers that are the foundation of AWS projects. Networking is about ensuring that the flow of digital traffic between instances or services is fast and reliable where necessary, and impossible wherever it's dangerous. I suppose it's not too much of an oversimplification to say that besides the physical infrastructure like cables and switches, networks are made up of device identifiers, often IP addresses, and traffic forwarding policies. Let's fire up an EC2 instance to take a look at how both of these elements work. We'll select a standard AMI and choose a small T2 micro instance type. We'll now select the only network currently available to us, the default VPC, Virtual Private Cloud. By the way, as we mentioned before, people with older AWS accounts will sometimes have to choose between launching a new instance into an AC2 Classic or EC2 VPC network. While the EC2 Classic option doesn't show up in this account, if it would, it would appear here in the Network drop-down menu. EC2 Classic effectively places instances within the larger AWS network structure, while VPCs are discrete networks all to themselves. It's important to remember that security groups created for one network type cannot be used for the other. EC2 Classic security group usage is also more restricted. You can't change an instance's group once it's launched, and you can't apply a group from a different region. We could now select the subnet, which is a local NAT network that's designed to pass along internet-bound requests coming from devices on a private network. NAT stands for Network Address Translation. It's a protocol for bridging local devices with resources on public networks like the Internet. You can choose a subnet address range associated with any availability zone within the selected region, which in our case is Northern Virginia, or just leave the choice up to AWS. In our case, if we were to choose availability zone US East 1B, our instance would receive a private IP address somewhere between 172.31.32.0 and 172.31.47.254. Since this is a private IP address, it would have no meaning for devices outside our VPN. They will access our instance using the public IP or endpoint that we'll let Amazon assign. But all instances running within our VPN will always talk to each other using these private addresses. By way of further explanation, when it became apparent that the number of Internet-connected devices was growing so quickly that we are in danger of running out of IPv4 addresses, network designers developed Network Access Translation, NAT, to dynamically remap IP references as packets move between public and private networks. Using NAT, a private network with hundreds or even tens of thousands of devices could all share a single public-facing IP address, relying on the local router to send everything to the right place based on a strictly local addressing scheme. It became accepted practice to restrict all local NAT addresses to three limited ranges and to avoid using any IP from these ranges in public. The reserved address ranges are between 10.000 and 10.255.255.255, 172.16.00 and 172.31.255.255, and 192.168.00 and 192.168.255.255. While this freed up literally billions of IP addresses for public use, the downside, of course, is that local addresses will make no sense in a public network. We'll accept AWS defaults for storage and choose not to create a tag, but because we're now looking at this from a networking perspective, and since this is what determines the policies controlling in and outbound traffic to this instance, we should give our security group some attention. As it currently sits, our group allows incoming SSH traffic from anywhere on the Internet. At the very least, we should limit that to our own local IP. 
Now let's say that we want to open up a port to allow MySQL traffic from a customer who needs access to this data. Selecting MySQL from the drop-down will automatically populate the port value with 3306. But since you don't want to allow just anyone in, you can select Custom IP from the Source drop-down and then enter, say, 54, 173, 88, 234, slash 32, assuming that this is your customer's public address. The slash 32, by the way, will limit access to only this exact address. We can now click Review and Launch, and then Launch to boot the instance. Let's now go to the Instance Dashboard. Once we're up and running, the public IP address that AWS assigned to this instance is displayed. However, if we ever shut down, or in some cases, reboot the instance, this IP will change. If you require a permanent public IP address, you can allocate an elastic IP and then associate it with your instance. From the EC2 dashboard, click on Elastic IPs and then Allocate New Address. Then click on Associate Address. Click once inside the Instance box and a list of all your current instances should appear. By clicking on the one you're after, the IP will be assigned and access will now be persistent. If the services your instances are providing can sometimes be subject to traffic loads heavy enough to bring down a single server, creating a load balancer with elastic load balancing can automatically share out the load among a number of instances. From the EC2 dashboard, click on Load Balancers, then Create Load Balancer. Give your load balancer a name, choose a VPC, making sure that it's the same VPC where the instances you want to balance live, and as a part of your listener configuration, select a protocol and port for incoming traffic. The load balancer protocol sets the specific protocol and port that you want your balancer to listen for. In other words, you might want the balancer to simply ignore non-secure HTTP traffic, allowing only HTTPS through. The instance protocol tells the balancer how and where you would like the incoming traffic to be forwarded to your instances. Your next job is to configure how the balancer will query instances to determine which ones are fit enough to receive traffic. Next, you select a security group for your balancer because no less than your instances themselves, you want to carefully control what comes into your network's outer wall. Think of it as a side benefit of balancing. You get an extra layer of protection. Now you'll add at least two instances to your balancer. You will, of course, have to make sure that the services you want to offer exist on each of these instances. Otherwise, some of your visitors may be in for a rather unpleasant surprise. Finally, you can assign an identifying tag to the balancer, review, and fire it up. The balancer details available from the ELB dashboard will provide you with the balancer's single public IP address, which, if you like, you can associate with either a permanent elastic IP or with a proper domain name. When your users go to this address, their traffic will be shared between all the instances you've included in the balancer. In many scenarios, the loads on your servers might significantly rise and fall over time. Perhaps you're running an online store which experiences peak demand only a few times a month or year. You certainly don't want to pay for all kinds of instances that for most of the year will just sit idle. AWS allows you to create auto-scaling groups that will automatically launch additional copies of your primary instance when demand increases and shut unused instances down when demand falls. This is obviously a subject that's a bit too big to fully cover in a single video. But just to illustrate the concepts, let's explore setting up a very simple autoscale group. From the EC2 dashboard, click on Launch Configurations under the Autoscaling item on the left menu. Now, click Create Autoscaling Group. You can read through the introductory material if you like, and when you're done, click on Create Launch Configuration. Now, select the AMI you'd like to use for all the instances this group will launch. We'll go with Ubuntu Server 1404. For instance type, we'll click on T2 Micro. Probably not the most obvious choice for a high demand deployment, but it'll do for our purposes in the meantime. And then click on Next, Configure Details. We'll give our group a name, and we won't select Request Spot Instances, but anyway, these aren't available for the T2 Micro instance type we chose. Clicking on Advanced Details will display some extra options, the most important of which is User Data. Here's where you can add customizing scripts to be run on startup for each instance. We'll leave that empty for now and click Next to add storage. 
we'll accept the default and click Next to configure a security group. Here we'll restrict SSH traffic to my IP address and add a new rule that will permit all HTTP traffic on port 80 from anywhere. We'll then review the configuration and create the launch configuration. That's our launch configuration complete. Now it's time to actually configure the auto scaling group itself. We'll give our group a name, say My Scaling Group, and leave the group size field at its default value of 1. That's probably not what you would use for a real project, of course. We can leave Network as default for now. Click inside the subnet box and we'll select an availability zone from the options we're given. Let's click Next and move on to the Configure Scaling Policies page. We'll select Keep this group at its initial size and move on to Notifications. We'll leave Notifications as default for now, but you can easily see how important it could be to enable notifications for any scaling changes. We can create a tag, and tags certainly can be most helpful when you're looking at menus filled with services or perhaps an email notification. For now, we'll leave it blank. Now we'll review and create the group.